hello, and thank you. It is such a pleasure uh, to join with you today, um, even if it's uh, virtually, and it's certainly my uh, honor and uh, privilege to do so. And it's certainly a tremendous honor to be the first recipient of the AAAP Arts and Advocacy Award. Uh, to be recognized by your peers at any time is a wonderful privilege, uh, but even more so at this challenging time for our uh, profession, indeed our country. And so this is truly a special moment uh, for me and I humbly and graciously accept this award. Uh, before I get started with my presentation, I also want to thank AAAP for your tireless work with me on the AMA's Opioid Task Force. Um, as everyone in this room knows, uh, pre-COVID-19, uh, we were uh, dealing with a public health crisis of not only opioids, um, but overdoses and deaths from other substances. And so I really want to thank you uh, for your time and your talent and your treasure if we have been on this journey together uh, to address uh, the opioid uh, epidemic. And finally, I want to say uh, that um, we are emerging or will emerge uh, from a current COVID-19 pandemic with a great need uh, for leadership as this country addresses what has been a woefully underfunded and under-resourced infrastructure uh, for mental health and substance use disorders. And so I know I will be able to count on you um, as we join together to make sure uh, this issue uh, is a priority for our country, um, and that we work together uh, to vision a system where equity is centered, but also where care for those who have a substance use disorder is centered. So again, thank you uh, so very much. And so the title of my uh, presentation today is Physician Leadership and Advocacy in Times of Crisis. I will talk a little bit about my personal journey, uh, the journey of the AMA and how uh, we have endeavored to lead uh, during this crisis, and also how we can work together again uh, to make sure uh, that the future uh, holds a place um, where uh, we have valued equity as well as care for those who have a substance use disorder. So a little bit about me, I know you heard uh, about me, a little bit about my bio, but I was born and raised in a small town in West Virginia, Bluefield, West Virginia. I uh, graduated from both undergrad there uh, and medical school. Uh, but I can tell you uh, that my journey uh, to there and my journey uh, since graduation has been one of twists and turns, successes and setbacks, and joy and pain. But I have tried to use every opportunity and take every opportunity for each of the ups and downs to be a learning moment for me. And as I look back now on my career, um, to and my ultimate uh, opportunity to be elected president of the American Medical Association, I can tell you uh, that every piece of my journey uh, has been helpful. And I'm grateful for every piece of my journey because I, I believe uh, that it ultimately helped me uh, to become a good leader. Now, I've wanted to be a physician since I was in the eighth grade and my uh, role model was Marcus Welby, and those of you who are my age will know who that is, and the younger folks in the audience will have to Google Marcus Welby. But what I liked about Dr. Welby was he, and he was a TV doctor, so this was make-believe. Uh, and what I liked about Dr. Welby was he not only cared about his patients inside the exam room, he cared about his patients outside the exam room. But also, I noticed uh, that as a physician, Dr. Welby uh, had a platform. 
a platform to lead and encourage and change things in his community. And that was very appealing to me. Now, I have to say, never did I in my wildest imaginations dream that I would have the platform of the presidency of the American Medical Association. And I will tell you that at my inauguration in, in June of 19, um, I said uh, that I wanted to amplify three things during my tenure as president. I wanted to amplify the importance of mental health into overall health care. And by the way, when I talk about mental health, as everyone in this audience knows, we are making no distinction uh, between mental health and substance use disorder. It is all important, right? Although we have our silos and the way our uh, system is structured and funding, but we all know uh, that there is no uh, distinction. Uh, the second thing I wanted to do was amplify the conversation around physician diversity, but not physician diversity just as an endpoint. Certainly, we need to make sure that the faces of our physicians match the faces of our patients. But why? Certainly towards the overall goal of equity and to make sure that everyone has an equitable opportunity to achieve their optimal health. The third area I wanted to amplify was the importance of childhood trauma. Won't surprise you as a childhood child uh, psychiatrist that this is critically uh, important. Of course, we all know adults experience trauma as well, but we know there are lasting impacts. And we know this from the ACEs study, and I'll say a little bit more about this, that there are lasting impacts on health. So never uh, did I think, uh, nor did I wish, uh, for a COVID-19 pandemic. But I think we can all agree uh, that those three areas have certainly been brought into even sharper focus uh, during this COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Now, throughout the course of my journey in leadership, I've had the opportunity to lead a public health department. And that has been a twist, uh, but certainly a wonderful learning opportunity because I saw the importance of integrating public health and primary care and behavioral health uh, as we look forward to vision a future of what a healthcare system should look like. I've had uh, positions in both the APA and the AMA along my journey, and in fact, it was an election loss uh, that led to my uh, work in the AMA. I was appointed a delegate from the APA uh, to the AMA from, from uh, again, uh, the APA. And that certainly was one of those moments where one door closed, uh, but another one opened up. And I think a great learning moment uh, in leadership to know that you will fail sometimes. Uh, but again, take that failure um, as an opportunity uh, to lean into a new door and, and again, continue to move forward. I was the 174th president of the American Medical Association. I just completed my tenure and the first African-American. And I said it was such a privilege, but also a responsibility. But I was so glad uh, to be tangible uh, representation uh, that you can, first of all, aspire to be a physician and certainly aspire uh, to be a leader in organized medicine. And as many of you know, and again, uh, you've partnered with us at the AMA on our work on the opioid task force. So just briefly about the leadership lessons that I've learned, because I do think, as I said um, in the beginning, that um, I uh, believe that it is critical uh, for physicians uh, to take a leadership role um, in the conversations that we are to have uh, when we get on the other side of this acute pandemic. But I do want um, to broaden uh, perhaps what people uh, think or, or about when they think about leadership. Certainly you can be a leader of an organization and you can have a title as I uh, had as president of the AMA, but leadership is not about the title. Leadership is not about the corner office or the parking spot. Leadership is about the work. And certainly as physicians, we see every day the impact of all of the determinants of health on our patients. So we 
have the opportunity to, to lead every day in our practice, to tell those stories, to let uh, legislators and policymakers know uh, what impact their decisions are having on our patients. Leadership requires teamwork. Uh, certainly a leader uh, cannot lead alone. It's critical to develop partnerships and allies. Again, to have a broad perspective of even what a leader is. Now, I do believe that leaders must have a vision for the future, but it is not their individual future. It's the future for the organization, the institution, the work. You know, I um, was persuaded by Jim Collins and how uh, he talked about leaders. And he certainly said leaders need to be ambitious, but the ambition has to be for the cause, for the purpose, for the institution, for the, for the organization. And he also said that leaders have to be humble. Um, I believe that humility is required uh, of a leader. You have to listen to others. Um, everything you think or say is not the right way uh, to do things. And I think that gets back to the importance of partnerships and seeing those who follow you as partners and as allies. Leaders are, of course, necessary in advocacy. Many of you know my story. I went down to the Georgia General Assembly right after or actually in my last year of fellowship. And I had an aha moment. I saw uh, that so many decisions uh, that are made in the state uh, legislatures and our federal uh, legislature uh, impacts how we, again, take care of our patients. So we must uh, be leaders in the advocacy arena. And I know some of you may be groaning, but I can tell you that that is so critical. Now, that leadership can take many forms. Uh, it can take your letting your own uh, legislator know of the issues that you care about and that you care uh, that there is evidence evidence-based treatment for those who have a substance use disorder. And I will say, say to you uh, that that is the very least uh, that you can do. Everyone um, who is in the audience should um, have a personal relationship, um, if not with their legislator, at least with the legislator's uh, health aid, um, and let them know what you care about. Let them know that you uh, care about the number of overdoses um, that occur in our country. Let them know that you care about the fact uh, that not everyone has equitable access to evidence-based treatment for a substance use disorder. Now, hopefully some of you in this audience may even run for office, and you can certainly be in the room where those decisions can be made and take all that you have learned as a practicing physician uh, to that office. But the bottom line is leadership and advocacy is critical. And that gets to certainly uh, the need to continue to engage in organized medicine, uh, certainly belonging uh, to AAAP and AMA and your state medical society and APA are all critical. And those are things that we have to continue to do. That gets to together we are stronger um, and there is strength when we uh, put our voices together. And finally, we must stand, all leaders must stand in our authentic voices. We have to speak truth to power, but stay true to those principles and standards that we believe in. So I hope, um, and I know the AMA endeavored uh, to be a leader in the fight against COVID-19. So I'll talk a little bit about how we demonstrated uh, leadership during this current public health uh, crisis. And the first thing is that we want it to be a source of trusted information. From the very uh, beginning, it was clear uh, that we needed to be a voice and we needed to make sure we were providing up-to-date evidence-based resources, um, research uh, from a source that people could trust. Um, early on in the pandemic, I gave a speech uh, through the National Press Club about the importance of our being guided by science and data and the facts. And I have to tell you, um, as I listen and have listened to the conversation since then, that is a good thing that we are hearing that a lot. Now, we know we're also hearing a lot of misinformation and disinformation, um, but a lot of folks are talking and being consistent about our message about being guided by science and data and the facts. Uh, the AMA has also uh, worked to make sure that physicians and physician practices 
uh, managed uh, through this crisis. Clearly, this was a disruption for us all, uh, but we wanted to make sure that we were fighting for resources uh, to make sure that physicians could manage through this crisis um, and be able to meet the needs. And there will be many unmet needs um, that uh, occur as we get on the other side of this pandemic. And so we endeavored to make sure that we were working uh, to uh, ensure resources were there for physicians. And finally, as always, we're working to reduce obstacles to patient uh, care. Uh, clearly, it was necessary um, for physicians' offices to close, practices to close, services to close, uh, to prevent the spread of COVID-19. But we were able to mitigate that somewhat um, using telehealth during this period. Uh, but we all know that there have been many obstacles to using that, and so we worked hard uh, to reduce those obstacles to care, and I'll say a little bit more about that um, in relates, relations to opioids in just a moment. Again, um, it has been my pleasure uh, to be visible and tangible uh, representation of our profession um, and to highlight the importance always of keeping science at the forefront. Uh, again, not only during this pandemic, but really um, for substance use disorder, for treatment for mental health disorders, um, science has to uh, lead on this. And again, uh, we have many voices out there um, that are saying uh, the opposite. You can't trust science, but as we have said often, um, there are not two sides to science. The facts are the facts. Again, we wanted to make sure that physicians could come to us at the AMA and get the resources that we need. This is just a sample of the resources that we provided on our uh, COVID-19 resource page. And so we hope that many of you uh, took advantage of this information and uh, continue to take advantage of that information again as we continue to address the current pandemic. We were loud and out front early on about the need for personal protective equipment, uh, the need for tests and the supplies needed for tests and the people needed uh, to track um, and trace those who have been exposed um, and the resources needed uh, for the medical community. So our key a North Star on that was to make sure we were pushing for physician safety at both the federal and uh, working with our partnerships um, at the state level uh, in, at the states. Now this COVID-19 pandemic has brought into stark relief so many things, uh, but I say three overarching things uh, that have been brought into stark release, relief, and this is no surprise to you in the audience. First of all, um, the health inequities that were in existence prior to COVID-19, but COVID-19 has certainly exacerbated those inequities. It is clear that black and brown communities have been uh, the hardest hit uh, by COVID-19 for a variety of reasons. Uh, certainly we know patients who had uh, worse outcomes had pre-existing uh, chronic medical conditions, but we also know uh, that many black and brown uh, workers, frontline workers, again, did not have the privilege of staying at home, working from home, and were out there on the front lines and thus at increased risk of exposure. Um, we also know that um, many workers did not have sick time and paid time off and uh, so they um, did not have the luxury, again, of even taking uh, time off uh, when uh, they were ill or feeling that they didn't have the luxury of time off. We also know that many members of the black and brown communities live uh, with several generations in the family, and they may not necessarily live um, in a living situation, a home that had multiple bedrooms where they could even um, isolate at home. So for many reasons, we see this unequal impact. Uh, now, the good news is that we were able to have that data, though it was uneven early on in the pandemic. And so that is one of the reasons why the AMA called on HHS to make 
uh, race and ethnicity data to, first of all, collect that data and then disseminate that data. And actually, um, that goes for gender as well, as well as zip code, uh, because we've also seen the unevenness of testing overall, uh, but certainly um, in communities that were hardest hit. Um, and we also saw the process there, right? A lot of our testing centers were drive through. Um, I wonder if people thought, obviously they didn't, that not everyone had a car. So this is why it's important uh, to lead on these issues, to be around the table, around the decision-making table, and these issues are raised to make sure uh, that an equity lens is applied, not only as we collect the data, but also um, what interventions are applied. Now, we also know that the other issue that has been brought into stark relief is mental health. Uh, now, we, I'm glad, I think we would all uh, say we appreciate the fact that the conversation has been elevated. But again, uh, these issues uh, predated COVID-19. I talked earlier about decades of underfunding and under-resourcing uh, systems to take care of those who have mental disorders and to take care of those who have substance use uh, disorders. And so we know that if we are looking at some of the surveys, everyone, uh, not everyone, but everyone is attuned to mental health, but we see significant numbers of folks who are uh, saying that they are exhibiting some signs and symptoms of depression or anxiety. Um, we just heard uh, yesterday, and I, and I realize uh, that this is being videotaped and you will hear this, uh, but Mrs. Obama, uh, on the day of this taping, uh, 24 hours ago, talked about um, how she is having some symptoms of depression um, as we cope through all of the issues uh, that have been raised uh, during this pandemic. And I know that there has been a great outpouring of folks saying, thank goodness, um, she put into words what I'm feeling. And hopefully those conversations will continue. But again, we will need to continue to lead on those conversations um, as we get on the other side of the pandemic. I hope that many of you know that the AMA, uh, we are quite focused on uh, treatment for uh, mental health uh, and uh, for substance use disorders. Again, I'll say a little bit more about that when I focus on opioids, but in our policy, uh, which is a lot of our advocacy is based on our policy. Uh, we are very supportive and appreciate, uh, again, down to our very uh, policy, uh, the need to address uh, these issues. As a child psychiatrist, but I'm sure many of you have this concern as well, we see the impact of COVID-19 on children. Uh, we see, of course, all of our lives have been disrupted, but uh, children have been unable to, of course, go to school. They miss their friends. They miss grandparents. Uh, they're missing milestones, graduating from kindergarten or high school and uh, young adults uh, from college. And so we need to make sure that we, um, as I wrote together in an op-ed with Dr. Sally Goza, who is president of the AAP at the time, we need to make sure that we have eyes on the children during this pandemic, uh, but also we know that pre-COVID-19, we were seeing an increase uh, in the number of youths who are attempting suicide and are dying by suicide. And by the way, um, a significant disproportionate increase in those who are uh, African-American and uh, Latinx. So not only are we seeing uh, those disparities, we are seeing disparities in access to care. So another area, I know we have a lot on our to-do list, uh, but certainly we will have to make sure that the conversations uh, continue on this and the need to make sure there is equitable access to treatment. Now, ACEs and my, my uh, desire to amplify childhood trauma, I think we all can appreciate that and we will need to continue to talk about that. People are talking about trauma now, they're talking about trauma in general, but they're talking about the trauma of racism, uh, the trauma of 401 years 
of structural racism and injustice. So here uh, is an opportunity for us to talk about the data and the research that we have on understanding uh, the adverse impact of trauma and also understand what's beneath again, those environments. And it is important that we as physicians lead on conversations around the structural and the social determinants of health. And I'll uh, be more uh, specific on that later. Hopefully you also saw um, a statement from then uh, Chair Dr. Jesse Ehrenfeld um, and me regarding police brutality. Um, it is a public health matter, uh, and we wanted to emphasize that and amplify that as we saw that as compounding uh, the trauma from COVID, compounding uh, the trauma from uh, racism. Here we have another threat uh, to black and brown communities that we thought was worthy of amplification and worthy of looking at that through uh, the public health lens. Um, just this past June, as many of you know, we did not have our in-person meeting. We had a virtual meeting at the beginning of that meeting. We also thought as an AMA board, it was important to name racism. Absolutely uh, uncomfortable sometimes to talk about. But if we are true, and if we are really committed uh, to addressing health inequities in this country, we have to talk about racism. And so uh, the Board of Trustees thought that it was important, again, to name that and name that as a public health threat and a critical component of addressing this public health threat is first of all name it, naming it, but then having further conversations about it and to look towards uh, solutions. And so the AMA uh, pledge again to actively work uh, to dismantle racist and discriminatory policies and practices across all of healthcare. And of course, that will start with us at the AMA. In 2019, we launched the AMA Center for Health Equity. The goal is to embed health equity into the DNA of the work of our organization. One of the most important bullet points on this slide is that the AMA is committed to voicing and modeling commitment to health equity. And we believe that uh, what we need to do to model a commitment to health equity is to look inwardly. As many of you know, uh, years ago, the AMA did not allow black physicians to join. Uh, but hopefully you also know that in 2008, our then immediate past president, the late Dr. Ronald Davis, officially apologized uh, to black physicians in this country for the AMA's past on that and committed uh, to further work on health equity. And so I would say each organization, AAAP, APA, uh, many of you may be aware that the APA uh, <clears throat> was appointed a presidential task force to look at that. We have to be unflinching in looking internally at the organizational level, at the individual level, at all the institutions that we, uh, we are associated with to look at policies and practices and norms, to look at who sits around decision-making tables if we are truly uh, committed to health equity. Many of you know that um, a lot of organizations are posting statements and that's good. That's a start, it's necessary, but not sufficient. And we uh, are committed to doing that work at the AMA. Um, and uh, we have recently launched a prioritizing equity uh, video series. Um, I recently participated in one where we highlighted uh, mental health. And of course that is inclusive of the needed work on substance use disorders. So let's uh, talk a little bit about visioning. Uh, and of course, I really like, I'm going to show you a couple of slides of sort of looking at a framework for visioning. Of course, there is no one right way, um, but I have to tell you, we have to look at this in a comprehensive manner um, and across a continuum for what we need to do to prevent health inequities uh, and promote health uh, and all of the systems uh, that impact health are here on this slide. And so for every system that impacts health, that impacts health, that is a system 
uh, that should be looking inwardly, looking at policies and practices and procedures, and how we can move towards uh, activities, practices, policies that create that equitable opportunity for optimal health uh, that I mentioned early on. I like this slide as well, and I want to give credit. Um, this is a slide from a group that I am working with here in Atlanta, the Atlanta Regional Collaborative on Health Improvement, and we have put forth this model, uh, being very specific about looking upstream, midstream, and downstream, and about looking at the action because this is where we have to get to, is action. And so here, uh, this slide represents actions needed at a societal level down to actions needed at the individual and family level. And of, co of course, those actions at the community level. So I like this slide because I think, again, it says uh, clearly um, what was said in the previous slide, but just a different framework and to be more specific about actions uh, needed and actions needed at all level. Here's one important concept, again, as we think about uh, inverting the burden, and I think this is particularly true for those who uh, seek treatment for substance use disorder. We have to invert the burden of navigation uh, in our very complex health system away from the individual and to the system. We have to meet people where they are, wherever they are, no wrong doors. We talked about that approach here uh, when I was public health director um, here in Folsom County. We have to make sure that equity is centered uh, in our uh, work to invert the burden of navigation away from the individual uh, to the system. And we have to make sure that the individual and family is centered as we all work to coordinate care across all of those uh, systems in my uh, first slide. So now I'll talk a little bit about uh, the work to end the opioid epidemic and again thank AAAP uh, for your partnership with us on this. Uh, hopefully you've seen just in the last couple of weeks uh, the AMA has released our 2020 progress report. Uh, hopefully you know that in 2014, the AMA convened the Opioid Task Force to first of all amplify the work that was already going on, and you knew this. Uh, you all were, uh, none of us started work on the opioid epidemic in 2014, but we wanted to amplify that work at the AMA and pull together a group of uh, physician organizations, again, who are already doing the work, but we also wanted to look uh, to see what we could do to better coordinate and collaborate on a path forward. And we did do that. We put forth our first series of recommendations in 2015, and we held ourselves accountable. Let me just, I want to just take a moment to focus on accountability. If we, and that's the royal we, this country, are going to make a commitment to uh, driving uh, down overdoses and overdose deaths, if we are committed to uh, developing an infrastructure and a system that addresses the need for those who have substance use uh, disorder, we have to make sure that accountability is built into whatever systems um, we propose. Uh, and so we have been holding ourselves to account on the recommendations that we've made uh, from the Opioid Task Force. And again, you have been instrumental in us all uh, making progress um, in this area. But clearly in our recent report, and again, not a surprise to you, that um, right now the overdose deaths and the overdoses are mainly a function of illegally uh, manufactured drugs, illicitly manufactured fentanyl. And also we are seeing um, overdoses from methamphetamine and cocaine. Now again, I, as I've traveled over the last couple of years and talked about the opioid overdose, sometimes I would get to a state or a local area and the mayor or the county commissioner or the governor or governor's staff would say, you know, Opioid uh, overdoses are a problem. The opioid epidemic is a problem, but here in my state, methamphetamine is key. And that's why I think it's so important for us uh, to look at an overall uh, system-wide approach, which I will show in a slide or two, because as you all know, we tend to, in this country, careen from crisis to crisis. And we really need to focus on, again, visioning a proactive approach to addressing this issue. Though we have made progress, uh, stigma still impedes uh, solution. 
Massachusetts. I still hear from time to time, although this is getting better, thanks to all of our work, uh, people talking about um, substance use disorder, opioid use disorder as a moral failing, a personal choice, didn't pray hard enough. And so that is still um, very much in play as an impediment to us getting to solutions and as an impediment uh, to folks uh, help seeking. I've already talked about the barriers, um, you know, the, the carve-outs, uh, the set-asides, the silos that are set up uh, that really also impede uh, progress on uh, this issue. Uh, again, pejorative terms and judgmental language still abound, and here's where we, and I know we have, uh, can model uh, as I talked about the AMA modeling commitment to health equity, we can all model a commitment to using appropriate um, terms and gently nudging others uh, when we hear them use uh, language that is stigmatizing or uh, pejorative. Um, we certainly need to continue our work um, with the criminal justice uh, system, but we also need to make sure we are moving from the criminal justice system. As we talk about health inequities, I say often when I'm talking about the opioid use disorder uh, that when um, brown and black communities uh, were using drugs, um, our approach in this country was a war on drugs and it was criminalization and uh, jailing those who had a substance use disorder. And now, um, of course, over the last couple of years, uh, when the people impacted uh, were white, middle class, and upper uh, middle class uh, families, uh, we now have a, an approach, a response uh, that is treatment focused. Now listen, I personally am glad uh, that that narrative has changed, uh, but we have to be respectful of the past. Uh, and make sure that everyone has an equitable opportunity uh, to treatment and those. We don't want people to have to engage in the criminal justice system to get treatment. I heard that one, one day uh, that someone said, well, you know, if that's where the treatment is, because we do have some examples of uh, treatment in uh, correctional institutions. And I heard someone say one day, well, if that's where the treatment is, you know, and I, I said, no, we have to make sure that we bring the treatment out. Uh, we should not have to criminalize people in order for them to get treatment. I know I'm uh, preaching to the choir here. Uh, again, uh, based on our though recent progress report, opioid prescribing has decreased by 37%. Of course, we all know that there were some unintended consequences for that. But listen, we certainly want to be judicious in our uh, prescribing. Um, and opioid prescribing has uh, decreased. Uh, physicians have registered for PDMPs and are using those, again, as a tool in our uh, decision-making progress, but not uh, in our decision-making process. Uh, but again, not uh, you know as a checkbox. Uh, it doesn't make me happy um, if everyone is registered for PDMP, but our patients still uh, don't have access to the treatment that they need. So we always have to keep our patients in mind as a center for the work, and it's all about patient outcomes. We know treatment capacity is increasing, but of course, with such a woefully low levels, and we still need to uh, do work to um, increase uh, treatment capacity. And I know, again know uh, that you uh, in the audience appreciate this, but I think we um, could do a better job of uh, talking about the continuum of care for treatment because I believe you uh, that, uh, and oftentimes when people hear treatment for a substance use disorder, they automatically go to residential or inpatient treatment. Uh, so I think we need to do uh, an enhanced job of making the point that there is a continuum there and we need to have the continuum of services available uh, for everyone. Of course, we are enhancing our education. This was, all of these, by the way, were metrics that um, we set for ourselves in the opioid uh, task force and we certainly uh, encourage and work really hard uh, to have uh, naloxone more read read readily available. Now, a second set of recommendations that came out are on this slide. Uh, hopefully many of you are aware of these and it was about decreasing the barriers to care. Prior authorization was a barrier. Step therapy is a barrier. Failing first, it's a ridiculous uh, concept for us in treatment, but we all know 
uh, that that was uh, a strategy used uh, to just impede uh, the ability of our patients to get the care uh, that they need. Uh, parity laws, if you know, as you know, have been on the books for about 10 years. Uh, but no one has ever gone back to uh, what I call inspect what we should expect based on these laws. And so the AMA in our most recent set of recommendations uh, and, and a project um, that we uh, did working with states, uh, we ask every state to make sure that uh, the payers in their states were compliant with the federal and state parity laws if there were any uh, state laws. Certainly we want to make sure we remove barriers to pain care. Um, it wasn't enough just to tell uh, physicians uh, to uh, prescribe less. Um, you had to make sure that um, there were uh, equitable opportunities for those alternatives to pain care. And we know there's so many barriers to pain care. We know that there's a history of criminalizing, again, another population, and that's pregnant women and mothers. And so we wanted to make sure that that as a special population, that those uh, folks as a special population had increased access to care. I've already talked about the criminal and civil uh, justice systems, but clearly, we do not want that to be where the most care is given. And we have to make sure that we are tracking our progress and that we are getting real-time, up-to-date um, information. But on the right of this slide, you see um, that it takes us all together, all of us, the partnerships and the allies that I mentioned early on uh, to uh, work collabor collaboratively to act on these recommendations. So as we look to the future, uh, here's a framework that was in our most recent report about uh, what a proactive coordinated approach looks like, right? Rather than what I said earlier, it's careening from crisis to crisis, from substance to substance. Yes, it was opioids, and now we see more uh, amphetamines. And you all know that as long as we have a brain, uh, there will be another substance. And so uh, we would do well to focus on and advocate for, and I know we all do, a proactive coordinated approach where there is a prevention uh, framework, uh, where we can get the data that we need, that surveillance, that public health strategy, and how we make sure that everyone um, has uh, equitable access and that we take evidence-based approaches and solutions uh, to address this issue. So tomorrow, we can say, we can fight for, we have a system that's integrated, a system that's sustainable, not based on grants that end after three years, uh, that's predictable, meaning we can predict a source of funding. Uh, again, we don't have to worry about will the next tranche of funding come um, and is resilient. Um, again, uh, we publish a national opioid policy roadmap and the key areas, again, so enforce parity laws, make sure that everyone had access to evidence-based treatment. Uh, and of course, we know for those who have an opioid use disorder, uh, that is MAT, uh, we def definitely have to make sure that um, we expand pain management and we evaluate um, policy successes, but not checkbox evaluations, evaluations uh, that are leading us to better patient outcomes. I've already talked about pain management best practices, certainly a part of the conversation as we talk about opioids. So again, what an honor uh, to receive the award uh, from you, uh, my colleagues. It's very meaningful. Uh, I look forward to seeing you in person uh, soon. I'm sure I will. Uh, thank you uh, for the work uh, that you do every day. And again, I look forward to collaborating with you. I look forward to partnering with you as we envision a future where everyone has access to opportunities for evidence-based care for their substance use disorder. So thank you very much.